Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to be previewing the second match of this Saturday in the Six Nations between Scotland and England. A matchup which is always tasty, filled with so much uh, aggression and passion to win the match. Over the last few seasons, the results have largely gone Scotland's way with Scottish fans coming away from both Murrayfield and Twickenham with smiles on their faces, in which respectfully I hope will not be the outcome this weekend. Now I say what I hope, uh, in reality, you'd have to favour the Scots in this fixture. Uh, looking through the lineups, which I'm going to go through in a second, you'd have to say the far more experienced uh, in terms of cohesion and uh, the sort of continuity of selection is all in Scotland's favour here. And uh, hopefully England can do it, but uh, yeah, the odds are stacked against us. But let's just run through the teams. We look at the front row. Scottish have got a rather settled front row of uh, Schumann, Turner and Fagerson, a real solid international front row. And they match up against Genge, George and Cole. A very interesting selection from, from Steve Borthwick. Gone for a very set piece focused front row, you would assume, with the inclusion of Dan Cole on the tight head. The tight head in England isn't the strongest uh, and doesn't have the most sort of depth uh, of options for Steve Borthwick. You've got Will Stewart and Carl Sinclair with Dan Cole being selected for this game. So uh, looking to really shore up that scrum. Uh, so he's clearly aware of the threat of both Schumann and Fagerson in terms of their power at set piece time. In between them, sandwiched on either side, you've got Turner for Scotland, who's line out darts and is and he's sort of known for his aggression around the field. And his line out darts are actually very impressive as well. You've got Jamie George, which is slightly less of a dynamic player around the field, but is just as good, if not better, with throwing his line out darts. Um, so that'll be a very interesting matchup. Going into the second rows, you've got Gilchrist and Cummings. Really good uh, matchup in the, the second rows for Scotland. The two second rows which have got quite a lot of meat on them, quite heavy, quite powerful, which provide a good few uh, pounds at scrum time and around the field helps them to get over the gain line. With England, you've probably got the most slightly um, athletic Maratoji. Uh, this is a really important game for him, especially with all the emotion surrounding a Scottish fixture. How can he harness this and not let his discipline slip? Uh, of England performances which have gone wrong, England performances of old, um, you'd, you'd, there'd usually be a theme of, of poor discipline in which Maratoji usually played a, uh, a big a big part of. So hopefully Mara can get on the right side of the law this weekend, yet still be effective. I was at Twickenham for the match against Wales in the last round, and Maratoji put in some really good hits and was very good in that game. So more of the same, please, Maro. And then his partner in the second row is Ollie Chesham, a player in which usually goes under the radar but does get through a lot of work in both attack and defence. Moving into the back rows, we've got a very impressive back row for Scotland of Jamie Ritchie, Rory Darge and Jack Dempsey. A very nicely balanced back row with the line-up capabilities of Ritchie. And both Ritchie and Darge have great uh, breakdown expertise, so it's going to be very difficult for England to sort of preserve their attacking ball and keep the, the mitts of all of those quality back rowers off of their ball. Um, Jack Dempsey at number eight, slightly undersized number eight, the same as Ben L, not the biggest number eight. You know, you're not looking at sort of Dwayne Vermeulen's, Billy Vanapola sort of size players, but they are very, very aggressive, very low to the ground, and uh, just as effective in different ways. And uh, the English flankers, you've got Roots, Ethan Roots of Exeter, in his, I think it's his first year over here in England. Um, he's not proven, I think is the sort of phrase that springs to mind. Uh, impressive player in the Premiership for Exeter. He fits the Exeter mould of the sort of smash and grab, powerful style, um, a set piece very, very well. Um, but he's yet to be tested against sort of real quality opposition and at the top end of the international sort of top five, top six team in the world. Um, but you've got to give him his chance and see how he goes. Sam Underhill, uh, this player has struggled with injuries really, really badly, concussions especially, which is probably the worst of the injuries to be suffering with. So um, hopefully he gets through this game unscathed, but he's a very, very good defender. Potentially slightly limited in attack, although I know he's trying to develop that, that side of his game. But in defence, in terms of tackling, I'm not sure there's many better players. Moving into the back line, you've got the sort of the very flashy 9-10 uh, combination of White and Russell. White's very good at providing Russell with the speed of ball in which he really thrives off of. And uh, Russell is just the ultimate magician. Uh, if you were to pick a player for a game in which you've got to score as many points as possible, Finn Russell's your man. Um, he, he's susceptible to, to making errors as you would if you're if you're that good at sort of putting points on the board. Um, this game I anticipate it to be a bit of a closer game. Maybe the weather's not going to be sort of sunshine and rainbow, so he might need to rein that in a little bit 
and sort of lean upon the more basic parts of his game which are very effective such as his sort of long kicking game etc and then England 9 and 10 you've got Danny Kerr who back in the day going to back 10 years was the, the sort of king of the sniping around and being a really annoying scrum half in terms of his ability to break off of the, the scrum or any set piece uh, probably lost a few uh, miles per hour in his legs of late but he's still a very quality scrum half and uh, George Ford partners him very good game manager uh, I do doubt slightly what's happening in terms of this English English team in terms of evolving when you look at the likes of Cole and Marla and you've got Ford is Ford going to be at the next World Cup starting at 10 do we need to be investing in Finn Smith or Marcus Smith coming through um, we'll, we'll have to see but one thing I do sort of worry about slightly from an English point of view is is care on Ford defensively uh, is, is a concern. Um, they're going to need a lot of help, so maybe that sort of justifies the selection of Lawrence in the midfield to add a bit more power in terms of defence. Uh, I'm just thinking, you know, we have a, a scrum, defensive scrum five metres out against Scotland, and you've got care and Ford on the blind side. If I'm a number eight, um, which over Christmas I nearly ate enough to be, I would definitely want to go down that way because uh, any number eight in the world, especially Jack Dempsey, would lick their lips at seeing Kerr and Ford as the two defenders. So um, have to wait and see how that goes. Moving into the centres, you've got the very settled partnership, uh, but very effective partnership of Tua Plotu and Jones. A very good balance between um, the sort of power up through the middle with a bit of finesse and offloading of, of Russell, uh, sorry, of, uh, of Hugh Jones. So very nicely balanced combination, which really tore up the field in Twickenham last time out. And then for, on the English side, you've got Lawrence and Slade. Uh, Slade really left no question to Steve Borthwick of who is the best 13 in England. He really did show up in the six, sorry, in the um, Gallagher Premiership over the last sort of six, seven, eight, nine, ten rounds. So uh, really good stuff from Henry Slade. Ollie Lawrence coming off the back of an injury. It'll be interesting to see where he's at. Has he been tested to match intensity? And can he translate his Bath form to the international stage? And then in terms of the back three, you've got Duhan van der Merwe on the left wing and Kyle Steyn on the right wing. Now, Duhan van der Merwe, I think he scored the try of the year. I think it was named uh, Twickenham last time out. The, the pain that, that try caused me from watching. I think I've never been as frustrated watching an international match. You've just seen uh, you know, a huge human being, don't get me wrong, but a winger run through about seven English defenders, none of which sort of you know, mustered up the courage to just completely crunch his legs. Not saying I would, because I would be the furthest one away from Duhan van der Merwe at top speed. It would be one of those sort of your man calls, but um, you'd, you'd have thought England would have tackled him, but he went through and you have to give him all the plaudits in the end. But a very good player, and uh, England needs to be very careful with restricting the amount of room we give him. Carl Stein on the other, ring, other wing, I have to say, in terms of sort of low error counts, he's one of the best players on, to have on the wing. He doesn't really make mistakes. He's not quite as flashy, but in terms of a solid player, which you could select with no real worries, he's he's one of them. And then the English wingers, you've got Daly on the left wing. Uh, maybe this is his best position. I think he's still yet to decide. Um, he's played a lot of fullback. I think his best position probably is 13, but uh, he gets selected on the wing. Good left foot kicking option. And uh, of late, I think his physicality has been very, very impressive. I never associated Daly with a, with a good, solid, big tackle, but he's been putting a few of them in recently. So fair dues to him. He'll have his work cut out, especially if he comes up against Duhan van der Merwe, that's for sure. Freeman on the other wing, uh, very you know, exciting talent within the English game. Be interesting to see how he evolves over the next couple of years. Uh, he's a big winger, can really shift, good under the high ball, can play 13, uh, can come off of his wing, a very, very um, promising uh, prospect. And at fullback, you've got King Horn, which has been a player who's really excelled and really shone uh, for me over the, the last few club games at uh, uh, Toulouse. Uh, he's been a very, very effective selection choice for them, bringing him over from Scotland. And uh, you can't go wrong with being around so much talent, being in the same team as DuPont, learning week in, week out in the top 14. Very good sort of career move from him and he's been quality out there. And I'm sure he'll translate both his really, really pacey running uh, with, some, with some good kicking from ball, fullback as well. He's also a very good playmaker, don't get me wrong. The big selection decision from Steve Borthwick is George Furbank starts at 15, thrown in the deep end uh, for, for uh, Freddie Stewart's expense. Um, yeah, this has definitely come out of the blue. Uh, I thought, you know, a, a real hostile environment like Murrayfield, give it to Freddie Stewart. They're going to be raining high balls down all day long. 
get a player that can cope with it. Uh, but but that's not the case. I mean, Furbank for Northampton has been nothing short of exceptional. Um, his distributing game from his sort of lens of being able to play fly half has really helped uh, Northampton play their expansive wide-to-wide game. Maybe that's the, the choice in which England are going to try and do. Maybe we're not going to try and play Scotland at the nitty-gritty game. Maybe we're going to try to open it up. Uh, if that does happen, that'll be very exciting. But um, interesting selections all round. Let me know your thoughts. And in terms of the benches, just to run through it very, very quickly. Scotland, you've got Ashman, Hepburn, who's from England, has played for England, moves over to Scotland. That's an interesting talking point. Should that be allowed? Shouldn't it? Um, I mean, for, for Hepburn, what an opportunity that is. Get back on the international stage and prove why he should never have been dropped. And then Miller Mills is the other Scottish prop with Skinner and Christie, the remaining forwards with George Horn, Ben Healy and Cameron Redpath, the replacements. And then for England, Theo Dan, very explosive player to bring off of the bench. Joe Marlow and Will Stewart, uh, the replacement props with George Martin covering second row or maybe blindside flanker with Cunningham South being the sort of impact back rower. I've got Ben Spencer, very exciting player uh, to bring off of the bench. A very good sort of mix of, of flair, but also the basic skill requirements needed with Finn Smith and Faye Waboso, um, who have been given literally no chance to come off of the bench and make an impact. Uh, I've never really understood, other than just to give them a cap, why you'd bring a player on with the best part of eight seconds remaining. I don't know. It clearly must be just to give them a cap, but you would have thought against Italy, we are more than one score ahead. Just give them a go. Let the let the young boys do, do some talking. I mean, Finn Smith isn't exactly a bad player. He's been one of the best players in the Premiership, so you've got to give him some element of trust. And uh, there's no doubt Finn Smith has outperformed George Ford in the Premiership season. I'm not saying it translates to the international game, but Steve Borthwick at some point has to let him off the reins. In terms of the previous encounter, Scotland beat England 29 points to 23 away at Twickenham. Huge result for them in Steve Borthwick's first game as England manager. Hopefully we don't see a repeat. However, the bookies are predicting Scotland by four. Scotland at Murrayfield is always a very tough proposition to beat. I think it's going to be a game of how the Scots get outside that new Felix Jones blitz defence of England and uh, and how England can potentially draw Scotland into a into a battle, into a kick battle in which the selections of sort of Ford, Daly, Furbank does lean towards the game style and game plan being. And uh, the set piece in this game will be another one of the hugely tightly contested uh, factors and elements of the game. Please do let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Who's going to win? Who's going to stand out? What's going to be the pivotal um, sort of uh, the pivotal skill uh, points is it set piece that's going to sort of decide the winner uh, is it going to be the kicking game what do you think let me know in the comment section down below and uh, yeah I'll see you in the next video take care